Blackburn slipping. Shed lobs it into Mark. No! Cowboys did it! Okay. The men's basketball team upsets the number one ranked team in the nation. The huge upset moves Temple up in the AAC rankings and catches the world of college basketball off guard. Plus, I'm Luke Milai, live at the Leah Cora Center. I'll break down where this win ranks among other big wins in program history and during the four-year Aaron McKee era. Courts in Session is live, and it starts right now. in the locker room head coach Aaron McGee got doused a once in a generation win. What a wonderful way to start our show. Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Courts in Session. Alongside Brielle Berry, I'm Emily Cochran. Luke Milai will join us soon at the Leah Chorus Center. Got to start deep in the heart of Texas. Al's taking on a team that had won 71 of its last 76 at home. Houston welcomed the Owls to their very own Fertitta Center on Sunday night in a game where Temple was a heavy underdog. In the first half, Jamal Shedd sinks a three from the right wing, keeping the game close from the start. Nick Jordan dumps the ball to Kerr John Cooch, slamming it in for two. Hysir Miller kicks it out to Zach Hicks for the three. This was one of his four on the day. Houston with the ball, Marcus Sasser drives down the lane and dishes it to Jarris Walker for the layup. With 30 seconds left in the first, Jordan finds a wide open day Damian Dunn at the top of the key for three. Houston and Temple now tied at 30 going into the second. Walker now grabbing the offensive board, fighting his way through contact, but eventually gets the bucket. Dunn in the paint now finds a wide open Hicks and he knocks down the three. The Owls lead by six. Juwan Roberts gets the ball down low and lays it in for two and finished the game with eight points on the day. Now, this is where things get a little crazy. Take a look at this next play. Here, Sasser drives to the rim looking for contact, but boom, gets rejected by Jordan. Hicks secures the rebound, but Robert sneaks in and gets it back, cleans up Sasser's miss. Here, John Cooch grabs Dunn's miss and passes it off to Caleb Battle, but a shot clock violation gives the Cougs one more shot to win the game. Shed tries a layup, but John Cooch, here it is, here it comes, he says, no! And then Reggie Chaney grabs his board and tries to lay it back in, but gets swatted by Jordan. With one second remaining, Traymond Mark tries to tip it in, but it rolls off the rim. Temple wins 56-55 in an upset thriller. We wanted to get after the guards and just take it out of Sasser's hand. You know he's a volume shooter. He's going to get shots really good at creating shots for himself. But if you make guys like that uncomfortable early, then the basket can be kind of hard for them to see. Dane was running out of steam, running out of gas a little bit late, but we knew those guys were in foul trouble. And so we were just trying to find different ways to put the guys that were in foul trouble in those sort of situations. There's a lot of winning going on in Philly. What do you think, think, think about this in Philly? I love it. You must be referring to the Eagles. You oh, must be in, referring in general. to the Sixers, yes. It's a, winning, it's a winning town. It was a historic day for the Owls for sure, and you have to give a lot of that credit to these defensive improvements we've been seeing. Luke said it last week that defenses win championships, and that side of the ball has been a struggle for the Owls leading up to this point, but their defense is ultimately what saves them in this matchup. Houston, who averages 76.2 points per game, was held to just under 60 points for the third time this season. The Owls also limited Houston to 33% shooting from the field and only nine total assists throughout the game. The Owls didn't even play their best game offensively. They went the final seven minutes of the game without a field goal. They only made free throws down the stretch, if you can believe that, but they were still able to get it done. Temple shot 20 for 22 from the free throw line compared to Houston that shot 11 for 21. And that is what the difference in this game was right there. If the Cougars knocked down just a few more free throws, we're talking about a completely different ball game. The team also did a great job of drawing into Houston defenders 
and kicking it to the open man on the wing. Like you said, um, Zach Hicks knocked down a ton of clutch threes, so he was huge for them um, going down the stretch. And I talked about this last week, Temple struggles going down the stretch. As I mentioned earlier, they didn't score a single field goal in the final seven minutes. And also have to mention that center Jamil Reynolds was still out for the Owls, but Coach Aaron McKee did say that Reynolds is doing non-contact work at practice, so I'm sure the team is ready for him to get back on the floor to help in that area. And that's always good to hear. Now with the win, our crew is curious about how many times a team that has beaten the number one ranked team has gone to the NCAA tournament, so we looked it up. Here are a few examples that closely match what Temple did. There was 2012 when Kentucky lost to unranked Indiana in a buzzer beater matchup. Indiana made it to the tournament that same year as well. And back in 2009, top ranked UNC was defeated by Boston College, losing 85 to 78. Tyrese Rice led the Eagles with 25 points in the upset win. Also have to mention that Temple, they are currently ranked 126th in NCAA rankings. So a lot of things would have to go right for them in order for them to make that postseason NCAA and potentially even the NIT tournament. Absolutely. Now, Temple, Luke Mila is at the Leo Core Center to join us live right from the Leo Core Center. So. It doesn't get much more impressive than this win for Temple all time, with the Owls only beating the top team in the country twice prior to Sunday. Now, there have been some big regular season wins in the past, including beating the number one team. But to find the last one, you'd have to go back to the John Chaney days in the year 2000, when Temple beat Cincinnati 77-69. to Now, there are other big wins over ranked teams, as I mentioned. Temple beat in 2012, number five Duke at the Wells Fargo Center. And then in 2010, against number 10 Georgetown, that was Fran Dunphy's 400th career win. Now, those wins are big, but you can find even bigger ones in the postseason. Let's rewind all the way back to 1956 with Harry Litwack strolling the sidelines, the Hall of Fame head coach for the Owls. Temple took on Canisius College in the Elite Eight, and they won that game 60 to 58 to make the Final Four for the first time in team history. They've only made it twice in program history. So when you stack up this win against Houston, against other regular season games and postseason wins, this is certainly one of the best all time. And with that, we're up against our first break. Coming up, we'll check in on how the women's team fared in a road trip to Memphis and a change that head coach Diane Richardson wants to see. Courts and Sessions will be right back. Welcome back. The, the women's the team looked to snap its two-game losing streak when the Owls travel to Memphis. Jaysha Clinton with the ball on the right wing and skips it to Terriana Gary, who drives and knocks down the jumper. Gary finished with 12 points. Tigers Amani Jefferson with the ball, and she drives and kicks it to teammate Hannah Riddick, who knocks down the long range two. Temp or Memphis ties things up at 15. Owls trail by six in the third, but Tierra East dribbles in for the layup, pulling Temple within four. She had 12 points, but it's not enough. Owls went on a 9-0 run in the fourth, but they played catch up all game long and fall 57 to 44. Now, although Temple pitched one of its best defensive performances of the season, a dominating effort in the second half is ultimately what gave Memphis the win in that game. And Temple's third quarter performance was definitely a reflection of that. They only had seven points in the third quarter compared to Memphis's 17. And with players like Hannah Riddick putting double doubles up for the Tigers, and she was also one of three players who scored in double digits. She had 12 points, 11 rebounds on the day. So a lot of those Tigers had great offensive performances specifically had a Riddick with that double double. And like you said, M. Temple put up one heck of a defensive effort in its game against Memphis. The Owls held the Tigers to 33% shooting from the floor, but we have to talk about Temple's Karanda Perea. She set a career high in rebounds, pulling down eight boards on the day. And at the half, Temple trailed 28 to 26, but Aliyah Nelson opened up the third with two made free throws to tie things up at 28. But after Nelson's free throws, Memphis went on a 7-0 run, and Perea also grabbed four of her eight boards in the third quarter alone. And then Temple was down 12 heading into the final quarter and Memphis began that last frame by going on a 12 to 4 run which extended their lead to as many as 22 points which really put the Owls in a deep hole that they just weren't able to fight their way out of. They cut the lead to as few as 10 but they just weren't able to come back. Absolutely. Now moving on, it's common knowledge that Leah Nelson is energetic and outgoing on the court, but that same personality follows her everywhere she goes, including all her social media platforms, especially on TikTok. 
The Philadelphia basketball community knows Aaliyah Nelson as one of the new leaders, not to mention a big ball of energy on Temple's basketball court. That's just who I am. But her basketball following is actually a small percentage of those who know her name. Aaliyah is finding another form of fame through social media, doubling not only as a D1 athlete, but also a TikTok star with over 600,000 followers. She's outgoing. You know, I tell her she probably needs to be in front of a camera. Nelson has created over 1,500 TikTok videos that date back even further than when she and coach Diane Richardson were a part of Towson basketball. She posted her very first TikTok in March of 2020 when COVID-19 started spreading across the U.S. My first ever viral video was like, 100K, and then my most viral video is 10 million. Even after Nelson and many others followed their coach from Baltimore to Broad, her TikToks kept flowing. The videos and her brand as a basketball player became more popular. The 5'6 point guard shows detailed videos of her life, glimpses of her collegiate basketball career, and relatable videos that sometimes rack up millions of views. I, I think I'm funny. <laughs> Obviously, but I feel like a lot of people don't know how much time it takes to like really come up with your own like authentic idea. As a communications major, Nelson's coaches and teammates believe her social media presence will take her far after the ball stops bouncing. She's already got a following, she's got a brand, and so I think it'll be easy for her to step into something post basketball. With my brand is me as a person who is Aaliyah, not who is Aaliyah number two, the Temple Women's Basketball Point Guard, who is Aaliyah Nelson. Nelson is passionate about her presence online, but her primary focus this season belongs on basketball. After this season, expect to see a lot more content with the end goal of building a brand that represents Nelson as a person and not just a player. The end goal for Nelson is to go pro overseas or in the WNBA, but beyond basketball, her degree in social media focus will likely be her backbone. She hopes to one day join a public relations firm, work in sports media, or run a social platform for a professional sports team. Let's take things back to the Leah Cora Center, where Luke Milai is waiting to break things down for us. Luke, what can you tell us about this matchup between the Owls and the Green Wave? Yes, the Owls. The Owls take on the Tulane Green Wave Wednesday night, and on paper, it looks pretty even. Tulane sits at 3-4 and four in conference play. The Owls just one game behind at 2-4 and four in conference play, but these teams are trending in different directions. The Owls have lost three straight. Meanwhile, Tulane has won back-to-back -back games, including an impressive win over second-place Tulsa. Now for the Owls, starting strong will be a big key. Lately, strong starts are something that Diane Richardson has been trying to pull out of her group. You know, we've dug a deep hole and then we have to fight back. So our concentration was not sitting back and letting the game to come to us, but us again, throwing the first punch, doing the things that we're, you know, we've been practicing and going at them. And I think we accomplished that in the first quarter, but then it went downhill a little bit. Coach Richardson was right that the Owls won the first quarter over Memphis 15 to 13, but she's also spot on that it's been an issue for Temple as of late. Going back through conference play, the Owls have lost the first quarter in four of the previous five games, being outscored 98 to 65. And let's expand that to the first half. When you look at the first half as a whole, Temple has lost four of the six first halves in AAC play. And when you expand that to the whole season, the records follow suit. Temple is six and four when it wins the first half. Half, but when the Owls lose the first half, they fall to just one and seven. Now the Owls' next chance to start strong will be the, uh, this upcoming Wednesday in the aforementioned two-lane game. And that's all from me for now, but I'll be back later on to discuss the men's game Wednesday night right here at the Leah Cora Center. But for now, Emily and Brielle, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Luke, for that analysis. The last time the Owls took on the Green Wave was in February of 2022. Down the stretch, poor shooting by Temple allowed Tulane to regain a lead with just five minutes relating in the third quarter. Now let's break things down for both teams. I'm going to get things started with Tulane. So let's roll the tape. There's two players I have my eyes on, Marta Gaelic and Dinah Jones. Gaelic is averaging almost 14 points per game, and Jones is right behind Gaelic with about 12 per game. The most impressive thing about the two is that Gaelic has made 58 threes through 20 games this season and is shooting 40% from beyond the arc as well. Not to mention she's also pulling down just over seven boards per game, but on the flip side, Jones is shooting 30% from three, 
but she also has 68 assists this season, which is good for second best on the team. And Tulane's holding its opponents to just under 60 points per game this season. Now moving over to the Temple side of the ball, the Owls are putting up about 65 points per game right now. Temple has hit more threes compared to its opponents, making 6.2 shots per game from deep while holding opponents to only 5.6 per game. Give most of that credit to Aaliyah Nelson, who has been the top shooter from beyond the arc all season. She leads the team in made threes per game, making 37% of her attempts. Jason Clinton and Tierra East have also been looking strong offensively, but both averaging around 10 points per game. Plus, Tariana Gary is another name that has come up often. She put up a team high 19 points in Temple's last matchup against Tulsa. Tulane will be on the lookout for her offensively as well. Now coming up, we break down some cool plays and get a one-on-one -on -one introduction to a vital member of the men's basketball crew. Our Al Sports Update professor Matt Fine spoke with a member of the team who is not normally in the spotlight, but is vital to the team's success. We'll see you in 90 seconds. Welcome back. With both teams being similar on the offensive and defensive ends, Emily and I will break each down break down some of each team's blessed plays from recent games. And we'll start with a play from South Florida's strongest shooter from beyond the arc. After already sinking a three on the last possession, USF's point guard Tyler Harris is already moving the ball like he's going to sink another one on this drive, and that he does. Let's take a closer look at this one. Harris hits Jalen Young on UCF with a nasty crossover right there at the top and sinks in a three off the bounce. That's something that he is so skilled as a player in doing, his ability to hit long-range shots off the bounce and off the catch. It's something that not many players can do multiple times throughout the game. Against the Knights, Harris scored a career high 33 points and totaled six threes to draw a foul on the attempt and make it a four point play for the Bulls. One of his 13 made free throws throughout the game. OK, my turn. So let's take a look at the final play of Sunday night's game against Houston. Jamal Sheed, he's going to take Damian Dunn 1v1. He gets Dame off his feet, but Kurjan Kuch is going to come over and say absolutely not. So let's run this back one more time. So she's going to have the ball right here. Kurjan Kuch is going to leave his defender on the extended elbow to come over and help. And then Nick Jordan is going to swat Reggie Chaney away. And that was just an incredible defensive effort for Temple to put Houston away 56 to 55. Now a huge win against AP number one school will likely do one of two things for Temple. Give them some momentum or possibly allow them to lose focus. We now go back to our good friend Luke to tell us more. Hey Luke. Hey guys, beating the Bulls is going to be hard despite their 2-5 and five conference record. Temple found that out earlier this season in a trip to South Florida when they won by just four points. But the key for Temple is keeping defense as its identity. The Owls are now fourth best in the conference in scoring defense, which has helped them win some games, considering the offense is now 10th out of 11 in offense in the AAC. Now the big key defensively for Temple is going to be stopping the Bulls' three-point shooting. USF shoots threes at the fourth best rate in the conference at just under 34 percent. On the flip side, Temple defends threes at the third best rate in the conference. All this talk and all these numbers mean it's going to be a good game here in North Philly. And all this talk about threes means it's time for me to send it back to Studio 3. Reporting live from the Leah Cora Center, I'm Luke Milai, Emily and Brielle, back to you. Before the doors open at the Leah Cora Center this Wednesday, there will be plenty of prep going on inside. It starts with an army of student managers. Our professor and executive producer Matt Fine is getting in some work and has this story on the lead manager, Shay Avellino. He is the smallest guy on the court. I'm 4'11 and a half. But Shea Avellino has one of the bigger roles on the team. Finish and one. Shea has been with Temple basketball since the day he walked onto campus in 2019. And this year, the graduating senior is the head team manager, which means he helps run a student staff of 14 at practice and on game day. I'll come in. Uh, every day, set up the court, pads, gum, cough drop, water, we clean the floor, I make sure the guys have all their gear for practice every day. And that's just really part of the job description. It's a 40 hour per week deal, at home and on the road. This season alone includes about a half dozen trips across the country. It's Shay's job to make sure everyone is on time, all of the time, with anything they need. We were coming home from ECU. Thursday morning, our wake up was at 6.20, and actually everyone was up, which I didn't think 
any, everyone was going to be up because it was so early. These guys don't like to wake up early. Shea already had the experience. He was a student manager for the basketball team during his four years in high school, and he had that foot in the door. His grandfather was friends with then head coach Fran Dunphy. I came for a visit one day, and Coach Dunphy, I didn't even actually go on my visit on the campus. I came to Temple practice that day. And I met Coach Dunphy there and he's like, hey, you want to be manager? And I told him who I was and who I was related to. He's like, yeah, like, you come here, like, you can be a manager and everything. So ever since then, I knew, I was like, okay, mom, like, and dad, I don't want to visit nowhere else. I know I want to come to Temple. And Shea has seen every single home game since taking on the job, and he does it with one of the best seats in the house. And that adds up to a lot of memories. I had to beat Villanova, and we did it this year, and everything, storm the court and everyone, that was just a phenomenal scene and everything, that was one of the best nights. That was for sure probably my best basketball moment so far. And Shea still has a half season to go. Reporting from the Leah Kors Center, I'm Matt Fine, Al Sports Update. Thanks, Matt. Time for our last break. When we return, Emily and I will discuss the AAC standings for men's basketball. The Owls are inching towards the very top. Courts in Session will be right back after this. Welcome back to Courts in Session. With great success comes a great reward. The men's win against Houston moves them to 6-2 and two in conference play, putting the Owls at second in AAC rankings. Houston still sits at the top of the conference, but with the loss, the Cougs are now third in the AP National Poll. Teams like Tulane and UCF are hanging in the middle of the mix, while ECU and Tulsa remain towards the bottom of the American. And with the Owls' upset win over the Cougars, let's discuss what this could mean for the team come tournament time. Now, Emily, how does this win against Houston affect the men's chances to play in a postseason tournament? I've been waiting to talk about this all show. In my opinion, the men need to scratch off their chances at the NCAA tournament. You cannot lose to teams like Maryland Eastern Shore and Wagner and then expect to make the tournament while also picking and choosing which teams you actually want to win against like Houston and Rutgers in that big game against Villanova as well. So I think they do have a shot at the NIT, but I don't think it's going to be enough to make the NCAA tournament. And um, like I talked about earlier, right now, Temple sits at 126th in NCAA college rankings. So, so many things would have to go right for them. They've made the NIT 19 different times, but the last time <laughs> being there was 2018. They've won the tournament twice. Um, they actually were the first all-time winners of the NIT tournament in 1939, so made them the first ever champs. And the other championship came in 1969, which was over 50 years ago. So I do see it being unlikely that they make even the NIT. Lots of history in this show. Let's talk women. Which AAC team do you feel is the most underrated? Okay, so the team that I feel is the most underrated on the women's side of things is SMU. 13 and six overall, four and three in the American, and the Mustangs are undefeated at home. They're 10 and 0. The only other two teams in the American that are undefeated at home are USF and Tulsa. The team is scoring just over 64 points per game and holding opponents to just about 58 per game on the defensive side of things. This is a team that I definitely have my eye on come conference play. So, um, who do you think is the most underrated? USF women's basketball. They're 18 and four overall. They're not ranked. They're seven and zero in conference play, sitting at the very top of the conference, and they're not ranked, as I mentioned. Um, number 32, Dolce Mengiadu is averaging 12.4 rebounds per game, which is fourth in the nation, and nobody's talking about them. But ending on some tournament talk and some underdogs is what we like to see. So same time, same place next week. And for the entire Courts and Session crew, have a wonderful rest of your day.